the sentiments of the last words and actually the whole of the song we've just sung is to remind us as children of God, as Christians, members of the church, that the world is lost in sin and that those of us who are saved from sin, those of us who are true Christians, have a tremendous responsibility to do what we can where we are to spread the gospel, to seek after those souls that are rushing headlong into eternity unprepared to meet their God. We know what the standard of judgment will be. In John 12, 48, John records Jesus saying, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The same shall judge him in the last day. Thus, we are mindful of the fact that the standard of judgment is right here before us now. We know what to do to be saved because we know the Bible. We know what's going to happen after this life is over. We even know what's going to happen to this earth. We know what death is. We know what life is if we know our Bible properly. But one of the things in our very secular, materialistic world that's doing all it can to push eternity out of its mind, one of the things you don't find mentioned much is actually the final abode of the wicked after the world's ended and after the day of judgment has passed. I cannot begin to grasp what it would be like to hear fall from the lips of Jesus Christ, depart from me, I never knew you into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Because once you enter into that place of torment and horror and shame, remorse and no hope, it is forever that way. There's no staying there a thousand years because there are simply no thousand years. You're just there in eternity, and it never will cease. Now, it's hard to find anybody running around nowadays, uh, at least loose, who understands that and will openly admit that they plan to go to hell. Now, there are probably some that are so hard-hearted, and they have such a corrupted, false view of hell, and they think they can handle anything thrown at them, that they might say, it make any difference, I'll handle it when it comes that's rarely the case in fact most people think about dying if they think of anything beyond death and eternity beyond death they're always finding some place to be comforted some type of heaven whatever their concept of it is usually it's not what the bible teaches a lot of folks just simply then therefore deny there is a hell or, as I said, they plan to go to another place, not a place of torment, after they have been judged. But I think it's safe to say that no sane person plans to go to hell as the Bible describes what in Greek is Gehenna, the final abode of the wicked, where Christ sentences all men unprepared to meet him at the end of the world. I think most think regarding heaven, well, that's just the place God who's so loving and gracious and merciful and kind and generous, he will put me into heaven. And so we sing the song, no telling how many times it's been sung or one like it around all of the religious places throughout the United States today when we all get to heaven. And somebody, we like to think, because the Bible speaks of it, is going to go into the eternal fires of hell. But nobody can hardly find anybody that's going there. But when you read your Bible, as we studied last week, of those who are accountable to God for their actions, that's where most are going to go. Because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be that go in there at. Now, God's a God of justice. And simply because he does not mete out the perfect punishment for sin now 
does not mean that he won't because time is nothing to God. And we do know from the scriptures that time goes on, give people an opportunity to hear, believe, and obey the gospel and prepare to meet their maker. Most people don't use it for that. But the fact of the matter is, is that there is that great day coming. As the song says, when the sinner shall be pardoned right and left. Now who spoke in the Bible more about the eternal abode of the wicked, hell, well, it was Jesus Christ himself. Now, think about that for a moment. Jesus graphically, in word pictures, portrayed the terrible anguish. And I don't know whether we have any proper words to describe the misery of hell, the pain of hell, and that horrible place. It was he who said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and, he shall, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And may I point out there, iniquity is wickedness that people do. A man's wicked because he does wicked things and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Have you ever burned a brush pile or burned something like that? Think about the word cast them into. It's not that they're just led into it. Their picture is being cast into that place. And what kind of a place is it? Is it? Well, he goes ahead to say, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 13, verses 14 through 42. We don't use that term gnashing of teeth much, but there's a reason for that today because we have all sorts of painkillers. But back in a day and time when people had terrible diseases or they had such wounds and so forth that they were terribly painful, they had nothing to assuage that pain. And you see it sometimes in old cowboy movies where they're going to remove a bullet and they say, here, bite on this. The idea is, is that when you have gnashing of teeth, that's excruciating, intense pain. And in hell it does not pass. There's wailing because there's such misery. But also, again, Jesus said, so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Now pause there on the just. The just are justified. The just in their life on earth heard the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. They humbly believed it from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. And they live faithful to the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, all the days of their life. Those are the ones God says are just, not by their own meritorious acts, but because of their faith placed in Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way back to the Father, John 14, 6. And it says of those wicked people that he severed from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There's that word again, cast, thrown in. And again, what is the state of those folks forever and ever and ever, and any more ever you want to put on there, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's verses 49 and 50 of chapter 13 of Matthew. People want to talk about God being just and why does he allow evil to go on in the world, etc., etc. But they don't realize the Bible tells you plainly that when in his infinite wisdom he draws all things to a close, thus he knows exactly when that time is that he is a righteous judge. He is a righteous God. He is a just judge. He is a God of justice. And there is that day when all wicked people must meet the fruits of their wickedness. And it is not something that just passes around and then it's gone. Now a man may discount hell, but man cannot escape it. People will say, well, I, I read that there, I understand what it's saying. I don't believe it. 
But since when does a mere man's lack of belief in the truth change it? It just doesn't. And today we're living in a world as the Lord's church, as God's people, where more and more people discount the idea that there is a place like the Lord described in these two verses we're talking about. There are a lot of preachers who seldom speak on eternal punishment for those who are wicked, who those, who, those who die unprepared to meet their God. And if you listen to radio or watch television, some of these characters, they're, they're going to get everybody some way into heaven, whatever their concept of heaven is. So this is the theme which Jesus mentioned quite often. Now that ought to tell us something by implication. Why would Jesus, the Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us, mention the eternal abode of the wicked quite often? There's five times as much written in the Word of God of divine eternal punishment than of divine reward. There's a reason for that. And especially when we, as we study the last couple of weeks that most people who are accountable to God for their actions are going to hell. Now the word hell down nowadays is just, it has been for a long time, has been basically a swear word. And yet there's a proper way to use the word hell and that's what we're doing this morning. More references are made to hell than heaven. You might take note of that when you're reading your Bible. And that raises the question with me, why is that the case? Well, we're going to refer back to a scripture that we used last week. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Comparatively speaking, of all those people who have ever lived on this world, live now on this world, and will live in the future if there is a future, who are accountable to God for their actions, most of them will be in eternity in hell. We use the term spend eternity because we're limited to terms whereby we describe eternal things and the finite state of affairs we're in, but you really don't spend eternity. You're just there. You're just in it, and it never changes. The straight gate, as T-R-A-I-T, doesn't attract the multitude because it's a very narrow place, hemmed in on all sides by the commandments of God, and people simply do not want to obey commandments. People do not want to submit to the will of God is set out in the Bible. And therefore, the straight and narrow way, the way of God's truth, the gospel way, will always have ample room for anybody that wants to enter that straight and narrow way. But it's the wide gate and the broad way that is congested with great traffic. I sometimes in I try to stay out of it if I can, but some of you, because of your jobs and others, and most people around Houston are involved in this traffic when you're trying to get to work or get home from work. And I often sometimes when I find myself in that position, think, now this is just the way humanity is, and all of them rushing into eternity, into torment, where they will remain forever. There's very few otherwise. We talk of heaven as a prepared place for prepared people, and so we speak correctly. People who go to heaven have loved the Lord in this life. They've been willing to sacrifice to be obedient to the truth. They've done all they could to bring their mind in subjection to the teaching of the New Testament. They wanted to form the character, their character, into the likeness of Christ. And so on you can go. So heaven's a prepared place for those kind of folks. They will enjoy the mercy and the blessings of God for eternity because they live their lives here serving him and his church. Jesus promised his own, I go to prepare a place for you. John 14, verse 3. 
So that's why we say heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. But do we not realize that hell is also a prepared place for certain kind of people? People who are sentenced to torment, as we read Jesus doing it, deserved it. They prepared themselves to go to hell. Listen to what's said in Psalm 19, or rather Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Interesting, you have an individual condemnation mentioned there, but then you have a national statement made of people. Of course, a nation's made up of multitudes of people. And it's important to know that when you've lived your life here to suit yourself and to oppose God and all that the Bible teaches about godly living, you wouldn't be happy in heaven. You wouldn't be happy in heaven at all. We get the idea, and it's one of the devil's ploys, that a person can be as rotten as Hitler or Stalin or some of those people. And God could save them and they would be just very happy there in heaven. Well, where do we learn that? What makes us think such a thing? God gave us this life as a schoolroom. The Bible's our textbook. That's how he teaches us. The devil provides our test, and we prove to him in this life that we want to be like Jesus Christ, that we love him and that we want to be in his presence, and we want to do all we can to bring our lives in subjection to the will of Christ our Savior, for he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And that's what we try to do. Even now as we preach this lesson, what we've done in the worship, the songs we sing, the prayers we offer, and our day-by-day -day service and devotions to God says, I want to go to heaven. It might be good for us psychologically to get up every morning and just say out loud as we look in the mirror, I want to go to heaven. I intend to go to heaven. And I intend to do what the Bible says to get me to heaven. And then sometime during the middle of the day, do the same thing. And maybe later on during the day or before we go to bed at night, look yourself and say, I, I want to do it. If I've done anything today that's wrong, help me to repent of it. Heaven needs to be kept before our eyes. Because if not, I know what will be before our eyes. And that will be eternity in hell. We are fitting ourselves for eternity in heaven when we love and keep his commandments for that's the whole duty of man but for those who don't then they're preparing themselves for divine retribution they're preparing themselves for eternal punishment god is basically saying i bore with you all through your life the truth was there you didn't use your life to find the truth you didn't care to you were wrapped up in the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes of pride of life and what you wanted to do you didn't care to and then here you are. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you have prepared your place for eternity where I don't exist. You didn't want me here. You didn't choose me here. My son came saying, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. You ignored it. You turned your mind against it. You just simply drove it from your mind and would not listen. You chose not to believe it. So here's the place you chose. I think we forget sometimes when we read Romans 1 and it tells how the Gentiles desired not to retain God in their knowledge. God allows that. But you get what you ask for because we're free moral agents. And if you don't want God in your knowledge, then he says, I prepared a place for that. Where I, my influence is not there at all. And that's called hell. Jesus described the judgment in these words. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. So if we disobey God, we serve Satan. There are only two kinds of people. This needs to be repeated most often in this world that of those who are accountable to God. They are people who are either children of the devil or they're people who are children of God. So we need to understand that those who are children of the devil are not going to go to heaven. 
And those who are faithful children of God and the Lord's church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, heaven will be your home. So notice the contrast which Jesus paints of these two. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Let me hasten to say what I've said several times. And that is, people confuse what life really is. When he says here, into life eternal, but yet going into hell is eternal death, they forget that mere existence doesn't constitute life. What do the people in heaven and the people in hell share? And that is eternal existence. But the eternal existence in hell, a place prepared for the devil and his angels, is not life. It's separation from God. The picture given of those who die and go to heaven is the quality of their existence. It's a glorified, like the Lord has. As John says, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's a body we're resurrected into, fitted for eternity, even as this body is fitted for this world. 1 Corinthians 15. So as surely as heaven is prepared for those prepared for it, so heaven is prepared for those pitiful, poor, unfortunate people who by their disobedience and rebellion against God in the time they were on this earth prepared themselves for the terrible, terrible sentence of God's judgment. Depart from me, I never knew you. Now when you think a little bit more, did the Bible say very much about the punishment of hell? Well, I think it's very amply described by the inspired word of God. Bind him hand and foot. Take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty-two thirteen. 13. There are those people who don't understand how you can have flaming fire and you can have outer darkness. Well, darkness is absence of light, but outer darkness is something else indeed. Now, that's the way you're going to be. How would you like to be where you can't see your hand before your face at all? At the same time, you're burning up, so to speak. An intense, terrible pain. And you're never going to get out of it. There is no tomorrow, it'll be better. There is no next week, it'll be better. There is no hundred years from now, it'll be better. This is the condition I will forever be in. Now, in my mind, now, as I speak those words, I keep thinking about, well, it'll end out here. No, 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 it doesn't end. It never ends. And this is the sentence that will be heard by people who are unprepared when they stand before Christ's judgment seat at the end of time. Think about it. God is always presented as dwelling in the light. And his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. There's no light there. It's outer darkness. No light forever. Only weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's another partial description found in Revelation 14, 11. And this gives you the idea it doesn't end. And, there, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Have you ever been, as we would say today, bone tired? And you get rest and you feel better, you're refreshed when you wake up. This place is a place where not only is there intense pain, agony, and shame, but there's no light whatsoever. It's outer darkness. The terrible pain cannot be even grasped. And it's all because you chose to suit yourself here on this earth and pay no attention to God and do as you please. And God says, I offered you salvation. I gave you time to obey. I did for you what you could never do for yourself in Christ's coming and doing what he did. 
And now you've chosen this place. You would not listen. You would not be persuaded. I reasoned with you, but you would not listen. Even people may have begged you and pleaded with you to study the Bible with you. Tried to get you to think on the level of spiritual things, but you would not. As Jesus said when he looked out over Jerusalem, and said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered you unto myself, even as hen gathereth her chickens unto her, and ye would not. Now we usually stop quoting it right there. But right after that it says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. What does he mean? You've chosen the way you would go, and I will not force you to serve me because that's no service at all. You would not be reasoned with. You would not follow my word. Time after time in your history, you rejected the truth. You rebelled against the prophets. You persecuted them. And, of course, what did you do finally to my son? Therefore, this is what awaits you. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. So there is no place of refreshment in hell. There is no rest. There is no time for anything like that. And how intolerable, yet you'll tolerate it. Is it in hell? Here's what Jesus said to show the significance of it. And it didn't mean literally cutting off your hand or so forth, but he meant the sacrifice that one should be willing to make keep going to hell. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed having two hands than having two hands and go to hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. The idea of worms is just simply maggots working in a dead body. They're always there. Death surrounds you and the results of death. There's no tomorrow. It's just always eternal light, the blackness and the horror and the pain and the shame of it. He then gave comparable teaching concerning the offending foot, as you know, or the eye. And he concluded it's far better to suffer the loss of these members than to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, 43 through 48. Now, don't try to tell me he was exaggerating or Christ actually told a falsehood, he lied about that place. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave his life for us, loved us with a love that my mind can't wrap itself around. And he doesn't want us to go to that place because God is a just God. It's also Jesus who described that place as a furnace fire. And again, there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So even as it is impossible for us to fully comprehend the glories and majesties of eternal life and the presence of God in heaven, even so we cannot fully realize everlasting punishment in such torment. But beloved, we had better get started trying to realize it and trying to get our neighbors and friends to realize it. Because that day's coming as surely as you hear me right now. I don't know when, but I know it will. And this truth about the eternal abode of the wicked is just as true as what it teaches about the glory, majesty, and joys of heaven. When you look at Jesus' disciples, you realize the word disciple means those who chose to follow after him and learn from him those who were very near to him and dear to him, and yet he warned them also, lest they should arrive in that place called hell, the final abode of the wicked. Here's what he said to his own disciples. 
And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. I've said before we don't have much in the Bible telling us about the nature of the resurrected body of the wicked. What you find in the Bible is some statements about the glorified body of the saved. But when we know that it's going to be a state where we're resurrected if you're lost, the resurrection of the wicked, so you're put back into a body. But it's always pictured as that which is eternally corrupted. It is pictured that way because God doesn't want us to go there. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east, the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. For the children of the kingdom shall be cast out in outer darkness. And again, there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because there's no hope of getting out of it. Matthew 8, 11 through 12. When you think you're no longer vulnerable, then consider what the great servant of God the apostle Paul had to say but I buffet my body and bring it into bondage or subjection lest by any means after that I have preached to others I myself have found to cast away that is rejected 1 Corinthians 9 27 now if somebody like Paul, who so steadfast and dedicated to the Lord, could think this of himself to keep him on the straight and narrow. What about us? If Paul could be rejected, what of all of us? One of the most tragic matters of our times is that even in sermons like this when they are preached, we have warned sinners. There are many, many others who are not warning sinners of what's going to happen. How many of the people do you think in the executive branch of government or the legislatures of the world, whether it's federal, state, or local, or any of those people or the folks wrapped up in news media and just general people in general ever give a thought during the day about eternal torment. And it's possible that they would be there and more likely they will. And they will if they don't obey God keep his commandments. We have not exposed sin probably as we ought to. We have not convicted people of how heinous in God's eyes is sin in our lives. And have we really warned sinners as we ought to? Listen closely to God's charge to us. It's found in the Old Testament to the great prophet Ezekiel. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked man from his wicked way to save his life. But his blood, his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Ezekiel 3, 17 through 19. What does that say our responsibility is since we know the redemption of the Lord? We're around people every day who are rushing headlong into a devil's hell. Do we do anything at all to cause them to stop and think? We, of course, must make a New Testament application of God's charge as far as how souls are delivered from death today. And that's by living the gospel out in our lives, which means we teach it to others because it's God's power to save them from sin. 
How many of us are really warning people? There are opportunities every day, especially on the job or whatever, that cause people to think about their actions. Many have no remorse for sin because they haven't been reproved for their sins. Many are not repenting of sin because we've not convicted them of their iniquity. Sin's something to be laughed at. And many are not saved because we've not shown them their loss. And when you look at the church overall today, and it's been happening now for many, many years, all we do is try to just have a fun time. I'm not talking about fellowship, the Bible teaches, and enjoying being with one another because we're all of the same mind and the same judgment. We encourage each other to live righteous. I'm talking about the people outside of Christ or even our own brethren who fall away. So many are not on the way to heaven. Some of them think they are but they're really going the other direction. And some of that's because we haven't done our job. So let us do our job. Then if they choose to lose their soul, it won't be on our shoulders. And we prove our love for God. Think of Christ. Now, he's the epitome of God's love. He became a man, was tempted at every point like as we are. Yeah, think about him for a minute. He went about every day doing what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us that he did. John says, oh, if everything he did was recorded in a book, the world wouldn't hold the books. So that tells me what he did all day long every day in his earthly ministry. And what we find uh, that he did, he did multiplicity of times. So the question is, where will we be in eternity? Well, as I said in the beginning, no sane person intends to go to hell. But that old saying is probably one of the truest, trite old sayings that's been around for years that the road to hell is paid with good intentions is what we ought to think about. So many will go there. Comparatively speaking, very few will be saved. And the question is, where will you stand in the judgment? Surely, we must realize the probability of our being in eternity, in eternal anguish, torment, shame, pain, and out of darkness. But there's no reason to be. Christ died for us. Christ has paid the price. Christ has shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And you read Acts 2, the church beginning, the church is the saved. And when people were baptized into Christ, having believed in him and repented of their sins, the Lord added them to the realm of the saved. And we're taught in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that we're to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know our labor is not in vain, pointless or useless, where? In the Lord. And part of that has to do with warning the wicked of the error of their ways. There's a day coming when we'll be relieved of all of this responsibility. Let us make sure when that day comes we have fulfilled our obligations to God in the flesh. And that we've announced to people the whole gospel of Christ, preaching the whole gospel, which means we warn people of what's going to happen if you die having not obeyed the gospel or if you're unfaithful to the Lord once you obey the gospel. We studied just a moment ago what one must do to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you have left the truth, Peter says your state of affairs at the judgment is going to be worse if you'd never known it because you've known the truth and then you've left it. I don't understand how all that works. I just know it'll be worse for those who know the truth and live it and then depart from it. We're going to sing this song in a moment. We call it an invitation song, sometimes a song of encouragement, encouraging people to take care of things in their lives that need to be taken care of while the message of truth is on your mind. The appeal to you from God through the gospel is there, making you think about if you die now, there's only one of two places you will eventually go, and that's after the judgment. There's no other. So with that in mind, heaven or hell before you, you make the choice. It's been said that God casts the vote for you. The devil casts the vote against you. Guess who holds the deciding vote? You do. Nobody can obey the gospel for you. And you must decide yourself that you're going to put God first in all your life. Because if you don't, 
We study today from God's good word what's going to happen. And when that happens, there's no end to it. If you're subject to the Lord's great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.